Don't touch the window. Oh, you're going to scratch it. <laughs> so that thing has now gotten eight thousandths out of round. Alrighty, so this is the first block. This is the one that we just got done with. The first block back from Heat Treat. And what I'm really fascinated by is look how shiny this still is. Even down here everywhere. Alright. It has like a uh, like a goldish tint to it so it's definitely you can definitely tell that but versus uh, these blocks where these blocks are ones that were done the, we didn't do these these are just half done blocks that that uh, came from uh, Tom's guy and but you see this they had machined it and when they sent it out for heat treat it turned it this really dull gray So I am really at a loss at what happened, but we had asked this heat treater, they said, hey, I'm gonna send you uh, two of these partially done blocks, uh, and can you check the heat treat on them and make sure that it's all right, and if they're not all right, just go ahead and heat treat them, because they don't, they don't care. Uh, it's one charge for however many, much stuff fits in the oven. So one block is the same price as I think they could fit like five or six blocks or something like that. So it's like, all right, well, let's just send them over there because it's going to be the same charge. And it's pretty obvious that these have that gold hue to them also that they didn't have before. They did just, they were perfectly shiny with this matte, dull gray from the other heat treat. So pretty interested in this and we'll go talk to Brock about it and see what they had to say as we get that back in the machine actually as brock gets that back in the machine and uh starts the next processes so here you're going to start seeing the the full second step which is basically finishing off the block finishing off the block to the point of putting it probably into the centroid to do more finishing uh i think so far in straight out machine time hours there's probably uh Brock could correct me. I think there's probably 10 to 15 hours to get the block of material to that. So 530 pounds worth of chips took 10 to 15 hours. I think the next 100 pounds of chips, because that's what it's going to take out, is another 100. If I had to guess, this very first one is probably going to be 60 hours or so, maybe more. Because uh, you get, because it's still proving out every every program, every step, making sure we're not screwing it all up. Um, then ultimately we're going to try to fix these blocks and fin finish slash fix these blocks and I have a couple other ones that I need to do the same thing to. So that is where we're at on all this stuff. Alright, so we just got the block back from Heat Treat. And like I explained to you is that we rough everything in and get it to within, some areas are actually more like a half inch away from, from uh, final size. But we... Uh, get it this way so the heat treat can get all the way inside uh, to very metal because it cannot do that in a great big thick plate. It is not the same heat treat uh, from the foundry as it is now. And so just to show you how much stuff moves, this is really kind of an interesting deal. This hole right here was perfectly round. Okay, This hole was perfectly round. This was one of our fixture holes. This was the fixture uh, puck that was in there to adapt which no longer goes in there it's like oh yeah we figured that but to give you a really good illustration of how out around this thing and how much it moves zero is the the uh machined size so that is three thousandths and then if you go sideways here 
that is five thousandths tight with three thousandths big. So that thing has now gotten eight thousandths out of round. Totally un unusable if we would have machined to final size, but that's why we make it small. Then we go into it and make it final size after it's heat treated. So that's a huge movement. So that's really interesting to see how much that moves. All right, so the car never left here because Tom Hammonds, my personal assistant this week. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. At least he's wearing the right shirt. We like that. That's all cool. <laughs> this thing is back from the dead. This is the car that's here. So in the matter of time that we blew the blower up, we rebuilt the engine that actually got hurt on the dyno and blew the blower up. Notice no blower right now. But we already had in process the second engine that we <clears throat> had all tore down and we're gonna rebuild while he was racing that one. So we finished this engine and built that one, rebuilt that one. And this amount of time, and now this one is coming up on a, a Hub Dino video next week. That is on the same scale as what it was last time. So, I mean, it's, I put it on, yeah. No way. Oh, oh, oh. And I think he was right. Okay, you got what he sold. All righty, so you just saw Tom Hammond's car on the hub dyno. I'm standing here at the hub dyno and uh, can't show you the numbers, but it is really good. So I'm really hopeful for Tom. He deserves it. Hope that thing goes out and kicks some butt. We'll find out because it's out there this weekend. But here's what I can tell you. I've had several people that have come up to me and in person and said, boy, Sugar Mama is an awesome car to win, but boy, I, I really don't need another car. I would really love to have an engine. But I tell you what, I would really like to keep the car, to tell you the truth. I really am starting to fall in more and more in love with this car. So if you win the car, if you win Sugar Mama and you want to trade it in back into me for credit towards an engine, I would be more than happy to do that. So. You win it, you enter, you win it, you want to trade that in towards the purchase price of an, in, of an engine, I'm more than happy to do that. I think that'd be great. Now, the second thing I also picked up was you can also get entries by buying a merchandise gift card. 
super cool. So like the guys from Canada called us up and says, hey, the shipping is astronomically expensive to just get a t-shirt and hat up here. We see you at the track all the time. Bonus, because all you gotta do is buy the merchandise card, you get, uh, I'm sorry, buy the merchandise gift card, and you can use that gift card at any point in time, but you get entered into the winning for Sugar Mama. That's a perfect deal. So anyways, remember you can do one of those two things or keep the car because the car is super cool. I'm a little sad to see it go to tell you the truth. Uh, but if you want to trade it back in for purchase pr uh, towards credit to purchase price of an uh, engine, I'm super happy to do that. So anyways, let's get back to machine work, billet block, and some really cool machine work on rollerized thrust. So this is still rough. Right. This is that's the only thing I've finished. Don't hit it with a fork. Huh? Don't touch it with a fork or you're going to scratch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alright. Alright, so uh, we have one part that has got the finish on it. And this is what I'm trying to uh, think about because you can do things the the tool and die CNC, normal CNC, CNC industrial side of things is make things as fine to finish as possible. In the racing industry, we don't do that. In the racing industry, people want to see that this thing is billet and it's like cool and machine work and all the stuff on it. Different process. So this right here is a 75,000 step over and Brock comes to me and says, hey, what do you think about this? Do you like that look? And I'm thinking, hmm, now this is still all roughed. Everything else is just rough. 
But this is an actual finished pattern. And it's like, wow, do we want to put that kind of pattern, uh, basically this kind of pattern, and that step over on everything? And I said, yeah, cool, let's do it. So let's see what that looks like. I think that'd be interesting to see what you guys think. Leave a comment on you think, you know, do you do, you do it so it looks cool and, and, you know, has this neat looking finish on it? Or do you do it so, so it doesn't even look like a billet pleat piece? It just looks like a, a fine finished, almost polished cast piece, you know? So interested to hear what you think about that. But I think this is what we're gonna do on this one uh, all the way through. So we'll see what it all looks like when uh, as we continue or farther and farther to finish up the sides. So you finish up the sides, the decks are done. The bores are for what? For 50 thousandths from final size. <clears throat> Although they're a step bore in this, but. Um, so the, uh, so that's pretty close. So we do the sides and I think uh, the lifter valley. Well, everything that's up on this end where the tool can get it. And then you're gonna flip it over on the other side on the deck surfaces and do both ends. Then it goes over into that machine to get more work on it. So it's gonna be, oh, uh, people, everybody asks how many hours you got into it. I think at this point, probably right to there. Let's see, I figured we had about, I figured we had about 15 when we roughed it. Cutting, actual cutting time, machine cutting. That's, that does not count endless hours of getting it to that point. So actual cutting so far on this, I think we probably got another another 10 hours so far. Probably another 10 hours. I think there's probably another 10 hours, 15 hours to go. So we're gonna be up to pretty solid 40. We're gonna be pretty solid 60 hours. And then that doesn't even board home deck ready to, <laughs> ready to, to assemble. That's awesome. So, anyways, uh, yeah, leave your comments. Tell me what you think about that. This is Cody. You've seen him off and on photo bombing it when at random stuff like a PDRA uh, when you put. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, got him doing something a little bit interesting because you guys would like to see the uh, we're putting a rollerized thrust in a small block Chevrolet for Aaron Jamboard today, and so this thing. Oop. So he's gonna kind of show this how you do this and explain what's going on. And, and the beauty of this is, this is actually the first time he's done it on this machine. So the nervousness is shaking. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways. Yeah, I thought this explain. machine was gonna crash. Oh yeah, well don't, sketchy. don't crash. Well yeah, cause it does some weird stuff. Yeah. Like it goes to zero and then it backs out and goes down and go rams into the oh, yeah, again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this is, yeah, so you can explain this 90 degree head and everything. So it's pretty cool. So it comes down mm -hmm. to center and then it goes in to zero and then it starts cutting and does a big circle yeah so it goes to the center and then it goes up and then it does a big circle so this will be in between there and the snout of the crank 
I see. It's on there. Yeah, does it fit right here? Yeah. Which I don't have the right ones here, but that's more or less how it sits. Ooh. Fancy. This is replacing this surface of the remain. So the crank will be sitting against this instead of the bearing. Oh. What it's doing. That's a really fast move to watch it. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So now you're just going to keep going in until they have the right clearance? Correct. Correct. Nice. How much farther do you have to go? Um, I think in total, like 70 thousandths. So we might, we'll have to take some off the front of the crank too to get it all to fit. Oh, okay. So. Well, it looks good. Thanks, sir. So Cody already explained to you about machine in the face of this. Uh, block right here with our 90 degree cutter on the old Rattler F69. This is really cool. Did you get a video of it going like this? And yep. yeah, I mean, the way this cuts it is just it's phenomenal. It's so hard to cut that thrust bearing in anything, so this makes it much better. But, anyways, uh, we didn't show you Cody, uh, just cut a little bit of a register, not into the um. Not into the radius of the crankshaft, but just outside the radius with this bearing and cut a little register to hold the bearing. So the bearing is now located on there and we built this little register ring, or Cody built this little register ring that actually goes on top of the crankshaft and registers this bigger bearing. Because that's a three inch diameter ID hole, isn't it? Yeah, three inch ID hole. Three and a half. Three and a half OD, okay. Or three and a half OD, yeah, OD, yeah. And so anyways, so there you have the rollerized thrust now pushes against, where's the cap? Oh, the cap's up on top of the, oh. Against here, now the, the bearing doesn't turn, nothing turns right there. So now you see how that whole thing all bolts together. And now we modify the rear thrust bearing so it doesn't touch the rear part of the thrust. It'll still do the front side, but we open up the clearance on the rear thrust bearing, not on the crank, but on the bearing. That way, it for sure has to force, and when the converter is trying to push its way forward and push the crankshaft forward out of the transmission, it will be pushing on that rollerized bearing right there. So we do these for big block Chevrolet and small block Chevrolet. Um, sometimes there's just a little bit of math figuring it all out, but this thing, the Rattler has made this so much easier to come in here and add a little bit of clearance come back in here add a little bit of clearance you know to make that just perfect so that works out nice so this thing is done yeah. we got five thousandths yeah so it's five thousandths and then we'll clearance the bearing in the back and then it'll for sure just be touching on the bearing yeah so i say yeah i'll say i don't know if we're gonna have to actually clearance it but well we, we give it a little close. bit extra because there's a little bit of slop in there yeah so we'll just hit that uh, so cool. So that's that one and I think you can just get on to we'll, we'll leave this whole block fixture and this this everything all indicated in because we got a couple more blocks to do. So we'll get the next block in here and Cody will uh, start plugging away at that one.